Welcome to this week's episode of F2BS, we your source for unbiased, in-depth, and entertaining news and whatever else you feel like. This is Clinton Whitmire. You can call me Witty. And I'm Chris Porter. Be sure to check us out every week when we have a new episode. We'll also, throughout the week, have some Twitter posts or maybe some other blog things uh, for stuff that happens in between our ep- weekly episodes. But on today's episode, we are definitely going to cover Amazon Fire TV, which came out this week. We're going to check on some whiskey and aging that we've done in our own barrels. That should be fun. And we're also going to check on an exciting news story of the week. So, Sounds good. Yeah. So to get to our first topic, our feature, the Amazon Fire TV. Now, Chris Porter is somewhat of an aficionado when it comes to tech and gadgets and all of this sort of stuff. I kind of just follow his lead and try to figure out how to use it. So Chris, tell us about the Amazon Fire well, TV. You've got one over there, don't you? Can I see it for a second? Now, what the Amazon Fi- what the Amazon Fire TV is is a small set top box that you hook to your television, and it's got an internet connection, and it allows you to dial up movies, music, TV shows that are internet based. So Amazon offers a lot of internet streaming television shows and movies, as does Netflix. Pandora offers music, obviously. This basically gives you access to all the internet content that you want directly on your TV, or at least that's the promise. Now, you and I have had a chance to play with this all day today, and we've had kind of a mixed bag of reactions from this, haven't we? Yeah, well, I think our, we, you know, we have a, a longer sort of behind-the-scenes blog of where we open the box and we start playing with it. But I think one of the things to really think about when you the Amazon Fire is comparing it to other products. So, you know, maybe the most obvious competitor is the Apple TV. And just for sort of comparison's sake, you can see they're, they're pretty similar. One's a little bit sort of... Bigger area yeah, wise, one's a little bit thicker. Boxes, they're both they're both black boxes exactly. Um, now the Apple TV is one of the competitors. The Google Chromecast, which you can see here, much smaller, sort of a different approach. Uh, the Chrome. So yeah, Chris, why don't you maybe explain to us the different approaches that the set top box versus something like the the Chromecast from Google applies? Sure, sure. So you know. The, the interesting thing about the Chromecast is, like you said, it's, it's just a very small uh, piece. It's just a dongle, as they call it, as opposed to a set-top box. Now, this has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that it's small, lightweight, easy to, easy to move around and connect to your TV. And that it costs, what, $35, $40? And this is a $35 device, whereas right. the Prime, uh, excuse me, the Fire TV is $99, as is the Apple TV. Right. Um, now... The Chromecast takes a slightly different approach. Both the Amazon Fire TV and the Apple TV use a traditional remote control. The Chromecast doesn't really use a remote control at all. It has no real user interface. Basically, any of, not any, but a lot of the apps that are available on your Android or iOS device just have a little icon associated with them when you have a Chromecast on the same network as your mobile device. And Netflix, Pandora, you can just choose to cast whatever you're doing on your device over to the Chromecast. So the Chromecast takes a much different approach because there really is no UI, as opposed to Amazon uh, Fire TV and the Apple TV, which have a home menu that you have to move around on in order to navigate the different movies and TV types. But at the end of the day, this is just a way for these companies to try to solve or migrate people from traditional television to streaming content via the Internet rather than just I'm going to a channel and I'm going to watch this. Correct. Which we would all like to see, but uh, and they all have different apps. We'll check it out. So we did spend a lot of time playing with the Amazon Fire today, and we will kind of compare and contrast the pros and cons we saw, but also how that compares to some of the other products on the market. Uh, starting with the pros, I guess there's one feature that we really liked, and if you read any of the other press on what's happening with the Amazon Fire, is probably the permanent feature, and that's the voice search. Yeah, absolutely. The voice search was a lot of fun, wasn't it? And, you know, it took us about five to 10 minutes to make that our default way of finding things on the Fire TV. We even found that we could do searches that were sort of contextually based, right? So like Academy Award winning 1978 would bring back pictures that were either nominated or won an Academy Award in 1978. Yeah, that, that was what I thought was the best. So the, well, the first thing about the voice search is that it's pretty easy to use. You have to simply hold down a button at the top of the remote, 
and you actually speak into the remote control, which is a lot different and better than some other voice controlled applications where you have to talk to the television. And if you're far away or there's background noise, it doesn't really work. The voice search was really good at understanding what we said on par, if not better than Siri or some of your, your mobile phone devices. I thought it did a great job. You know, we did searches for things like 24 and it, it didn't do 24 as words. It did. Right. It knew that we wanted 24, the, the show with Kiefer Sutherland. You know, I was very impressed. It got Foo Fighters on the second time. Um, <laughs> it took me twice to do that. But, you know, I was, I was very impressed with the voice search and it by far the easiest way to search for a movie or TV show that I've found. There's no clicking through or browsing or saying, oh, I'm looking for comedies or dramas. And that, and, and Chris alluded to this, you could say comedy and it would pull up comedies. It didn't just search for the title. It kind of knew. It had the context, as Chris said. You could say a year. It found it. And so that, that was really actually a fun way to look for stuff. So we said 1984. We saw Ghostbusters. Pretty cool uh, for those of you into that. Um, why don't you tell us about some of the other things you yeah, thought were good Yeah, let's talk about, about the other, a couple other of the positives. The, you know, the speed and the quality of the responsiveness was, was outstanding, in my opinion. You know, it didn't feel slow in the least bit. You know, I believe this has a quad-core processor. It's, it's really snappy, and it, you could tell. You know, we, you have a Google TV, and we used that a couple hours after the Amazon TV, and it felt, while the Google TV has some neat features, it felt really slow to me. We were really waiting compared to this. This was uh, very snappy to move around the screen, and not only that, but to get the movie started, that feature where they're where they're buffering things in advance and trying to figure out what you want to watch before you start watching it worked really well. There's very, there's very little wasted time when you compare it to an Apple TV or some other devices where you have to wait a few seconds, sometimes a minute, for things to queue. This was really really fast when once you selected a title, um, and what was even more impressive to me was once you were already watching something. When you fast forward or rewinded, once once you said, okay, I found my spot, it queued up immediately again. So the whole speed, quality, getting the top resolution was really uh, impressive compared to other devices. Right. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but they're doing a good job of that. The third thing that we liked was the fact that my Amazon account was already on this box when we powered it up and plugged it in. You know, we had to connect to a Wi-Fi network, but that was it. Other than that, we were ready to go with our Amazon account, instant streaming there. I didn't have to add any credit card information or login. It's anything. kind of a pro and a con, though. So if you if you are an Amazon Prime customer, so that's one thing. You have to already be an Amazon Prime customer. And if you are and you order it through your Prime account, and we're not sure where the address has to be, but we got it. He ordered through his Prime account, and it worked. Once we plugged it in and hooked it up to the television, it was ready to go and it knew who we were and he could instantly buy things via his Amazon account. Now, the con to me is if you want to buy one as a gift, I, I'm not sure what happens when you say, hey, I gave it to you. Does it already link to my account? So, And then is it the responsibility of the person receiving the gift to unlink it or can I, as a gift giver, unlink it somehow myself from my Amazon account? That's a question I don't know the answer to yet. So while we certainly found some things to like, don't mistake us for thinking that we really like the product. Yeah. Unfortunately, the list of cons probably at this stage for what they've released outweighs the pros. And let's uh, talk about some Yeah, why, why don't you kick it off for us? Okay, Chris. so if you ask me the big con is that the thing is geared to send you to watch Amazon Prime and Amazon Instant Streaming videos. Or to buy things from Amazon. Um, the voice search really only works with Amazon content. There was a little bit of Hulu Plus content, some Vivo content. It did the voice search did not work with Netflix. That was a huge drawback when the entire search mechanism on this device is based around voice. So let's give you a great example of that. When we were playing around with it, we searched for the Netflix hit show with Kevin Spacey, House of Cards. It popped up. We clicked on it, and it said buy an episode or the season for two dollars or thirty dollars via. Amazon. Now there's a there's a weird function where you say, well, I want to find another way to watch. So anytime you search, it always proposes the buy from Amazon. When you say more ways to watch, it did not suggest Netflix as an option, even though Netflix was an app that we had already installed and were logged into. So it was really it wasn't just recommending the Amazon's product, but it was excluding the Netflix product. So if you wanted to watch it for free, 
you had to manually browse through to Netflix just like you would on an Apple TV or any exactly. other device, which really offsets the benefit of that great voice search right. capability that the product has. And some of the promises, if you ask me, that Amazon made when they came out with this product, which were that we were, are going to combine all the video services together and we are going to do search all in one place. And maybe that's still their plan. Maybe that's something that's coming. And I hope to see that in a software update down the road. But right now, the integration of all the apps with the voice search just isn't there. And that leaves a lot to be desired when you've got Showtime and ESPN and all these other great video apps that should utilize that voice search but don't. Right. So this Amazon focus was one thing we saw. The other thing in general was a sort of a clunky user interface. While the voice search worked great, if you were scrolling, it was hard to find stuff. You couldn't find the entire app store. The, the top section of the search actually mixed uh, shows and movies together with apps. So it was sort of confusing. There were areas where if you hit the button too many times, it would take you out of a search that you just did, and then you had to start the search all over. It couldn't, you couldn't get back into it. Um, so there was just a lot. There were a lot of small little bugs. It's, it's not really bad, but it's not particularly intuitive. Uh, and particularly when you think about this, this button, if you look at the remote, maybe hard to see here. There's a few more buttons compared to the Apple TV. The Apple TV is a smaller silver one, and again. They do different things in different apps. It's very individual, and it was very easy to hit the wrong button, end up in a different place, and it's just not not a major issue, but not great for the user experience. The UI definitely felt a little half-baked and maybe a little bit unfinished, which I think is why they're pushing the voice search so much, because that is the best UI they have right now is the voice search. Uh, another thing, you know, there are a few apps that you just can't get on the Amazon Fire. HBO Go being the primary example. That's a huge deal to me. I love HBO. I love Game of Thrones. I like I watching watch reruns it. of The Wire. Exactly. There, there's so many awesome so, shows. Some people are into girls. You know, <laughs> those aren't my kind of girls. I, I like them a little bit skinnier than that. But, you know, hey, everybody's got their own thing. Yeah. And it's a good show, even if, you know, you have to turn your eyes away sometime. So, you know, apps like HBO Go, music apps like Spotify, things like Songza, they're just not there and they're just not available. And, you know, because it's an Android-based platform, again, maybe that'll come in time, but it's not there yet. Yeah, so you mentioned in Spotify, that's actually, you know, I'm a Spotify subscriber. You know, Pandora is the dominant music uh, app program that's featured on the Amazon Fire TV. There's TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, a couple of other things. And music was supposed to be one of the real advantages of this product in that there was supposedly a feature where you could do music and it would show you the lyrics. We really couldn't get that to work. It sounds like that's something that's going to come out in the future. Vivo I, videos are there, but they're not really in the music. And I guess you had an issue because you actually have a fairly large Amazon music library already. Is that correct? Right. There is no Amazon access to the Am your Amazon music library, which just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, we've got a product that's pushing Amazon in every way, shape, or form. We've got music services involved. Why is my Amazon Cloud MP3 player not accessible from the Amazon Fire TV? Now, now one thing, to be fair, that the Fire TV does that other products don't do is you can play music via the limited music services there are while, for example, playing a game, which some people consider a benefit. We've not talked much about the games because, to me, it's really not really that big of a feature. Um, so you can play music while surfing through the surfing for movies or playing a game, which is nice. But because it lacks some of those apps like a Spotify, um, you know, a Sonos, which is a totally separate hardware system. We don't we'll get into that on a different episode, does that a lot better. So, yeah, it's kind of a benefit. But in general, the music's lacking. Um, I, I don't know. That, that's kind of my thoughts on that music topic. I definitely felt like the music services should be a lot stronger. Even the Pandora app, the UI was was ugly, and it looked like a port of an Android app, which I'm assuming it is. Our final con was that there's really, you know, when you compare them to things like the Chromecast and the Apple TV, which allow you to cast content from your mobile device, there's really no ability to do that on the Amazon unless you have a Kindle Fire HDX. And not even a Kindle Fire, the, spe the specific latest and greatest Kindle I see that as a big drawback. All of these other devices pretty much give you that, that opportunity with less of a specific device that you have to have. Well, that's actually a, a funny point. So I have Apple TV and I have an iPad. So, you know, it sounds like, hey, there's a lot of Apple integration. And that's a common theme. The, the box producers are very integrated with their own content, which is not necessarily surprising, though the Amazon more so. But I could actually use Amazon Prime's app on the iPad, on the iPad or the iPhone 
and beam it or cast it over to my Apple TV and watch Amazon Prime, not quite as slickly as I can on the Amazon Fire TV, but good enough to not justify spending $99 on right. yet another box. Right, right. Because right now, the thing that this box does best is stream Amazon content. And it does a really good job of that, but it doesn't do a very good job of much else. And ultimately, you know, while this box is powerful, we can't really recommend it for unless you're deep into the Amazon world and likely a Kindle Fire HDX owner. Now, that certainly could change in the future. Absolutely. If you if you have another box or you have a Chromecast already, odds are that this is not going to really upgrade your experience that significantly, especially for the $99 price tag. If you don't have a box, and to Chris's point, you have a Kindle Fire HDX, which gives you that beaming the, casting capability, extra capability. or you, you, you don't necessarily care about HBO Go and the primary thing you watch is Amazon Prime, then this actually could be a great, great product. Now, let's check back in a couple of months. Maybe there'll be some software upgrades, some additional uh, content deals, some more apps. And who knows? This, this might really be the thing. What I'm really curious about is when people see how good the voice search works, is Apple going to come out with their own voice search or Google? And, you know, so who knows? Maybe this will spur everybody to do a better job. What I'd really love to see is one product that gives you all the content you want in one place and is not trying to constantly push its own thing. That, to me, would be, for a consumer, a perspective, the ideal. That's our take on the Amazon Fire. Be sure to check out uh, FWS.com, where you'll be able to uh, see some behind-the-scenes footage and actual scrolling through some menus. It's very raw, because it was really, literally us taken out of the box, but it could be interesting for you guys to watch. We're going to shift gears on you now and uh, talk a little bit about whiskey and, and sherry. Now, they might seem like two kind of different ideas, but uh, I'll explain what we mean. I'm moving here. You can see there's a nice sort of small American oak barrel right in front of us. has a nice little spout on the front, a cork tap on the top there. Um, and, you know, people talk about craft beers and, and fine wines and everything else. But I think the next thing that's starting to get popular is people want to make their own whiskey. So it's not just you want to make your own beer at home, home brew. You want to make your own whiskey. So how, how does that kind of work? There are places and... and but you can buy these on the internet at different places or locally. You can get your own oak barrel and then you can get things like corn moonshine or raw bourbon that hasn't been aged. So the bourbon you buy or the whiskey you buy in a store like Jack Daniels or Maker's Mark has been aged for a long time, okay. six, seven years or, you know, or more. You can buy your own barrels, get this pure stuff, pour it in here and age it. Now, what's interesting is these smaller barrels, there's a higher ratio of surface area to liquor than there is in the giant barrels that people use when they're making corn whiskey and bourbon and things like that, the, the commercial production. So you don't necessarily need to age it for seven years. It really only needs a few weeks. Now, every time, so four to six weeks, every time you use it, it gradually loses some of the oak flavor because it's already been taken out. And each subsequent time that you do use it, um, that flavor of what was in there before is going to be imparted upon it. So you have it. a little bit of a residual effect of, of whatever you put in there. Right. So, so for example, what we did, um, so a, a friend and I each got one of these around Christmas time. It was a good Christmas present. So that, you know, when people give you liquor, you can't complain. The only thing you can complain about is you have to wait months before you can actually drink the present they gave you. So I guess you can complain a little bit. But... Um, so my it's friend, the fun of it, right? It's a do-it-yourself. Well, it is, it is the fun of it. It's certainly gotten to be a bigger project than I ever hoped. <laughs> my friend decided he was going to just pour the corn whiskey straight in right away, and I said, "Well, let's give it something to compare." So we actually bought some sherry and poured sherry in here first, and let that age for five weeks. Okay. And that way, when we pour the corn whiskey in, hopefully, we'll get some of that sherry flavor soaking out into the pure corn whiskey. Now, we still have to wait because, as I mentioned, once you do one thing, then it takes longer the second time. What we're going to do for you here is, is two things. We are going to first do a blind taste test where we compare the sherry that we put in uh, back in January, aged for five weeks, with the sherry as it was before we put it in. And our producer, Dasha, is actually going to blindfold us 
and C, does it really make a difference? Does aging something in an oak barrel really make a difference? This should be interesting. Oh, I'm first? Okay. Yeah, so hopefully the, the vodka and the beer we're currently drinking will not uh, impact our taste buds too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's a good look for you. If, if you can't see, there's actual very odd-shaped cats. I can still see the microphone, which is good. You can okay. see the microphone. Yeah, I can see the microphone. Don't, don't, so get... don't cheat. No, I'm not, I'm not going to look at the... Uh... This is so. This is sherry. This is. Ow. And how long did how long Ow. did you age this sherry? So this sherry was in these barrels for five weeks. Okay. Um, I guess. So do you want me to try it first? It's up to you. Okay. So so I I can't see this. I have two shot glasses in my hand. One of which is the unoaked sort of sherry that we bought from the store, and one is a sherry that's been there for five weeks. So I'm going to try one after the other. Now, what is sherry exactly, anyway? Or, or you're drinking right now, aren't you? Well, yeah, sherry. You know, sherry is just a, it's an aged it, it's an aged sort of uh, grape product, sort of sweet, get like a dessert quality. I'm trying to. I have very bad nose problems. We'll talk about that in a minute. I think we should do the whole show like this. By the way, <laughs> this is this this is really weird. <laughs> yeah, so I think this one ha is the more oaky. I have to try it. I've just smelled them now. Oh, and I'm pretty sure that's I'm pretty sure that's correct. I think I can taste the oak, I, but I'm gonna let uh, Chris try it here now. All right. So how are we doing this handoff here? Da, da, uh, Dasha, our producer, will I'm will just give hold it to my you. Hands just out. just put your hands on the table. She she does a good job. Okay. Chris, stop touching my leg. <laughs> that's your leg. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, oak. You know, for people who aren't you know necessarily experienced drinkers, this is what's really interesting because you you know oak has a very distinctive characteristic. And wines, or also, oh, I'm finally finally can see again. So we have to see if he gets it right or wrong. See, I think I always have trouble with the sherry. Did, did, I, did I get it right? All right, I got it right. So that was that was good to hear. Sorry for my eyes watering. It was very tight. This blindfold. That's pretty good. So which one do you I think? I haven't has... tried the other one yet. Oh, okay. So for those of you at home, it's. That one is the oaked one. Quite, uh, quite the excitement as he continues to drink. <laughs> but so, so the, the, you know, after five weeks in the barrel, it certainly makes a, a big difference. And what's interesting is, you know, the sherry that we bought is a, is a pretty cheap sherry because we were just trying to condition the right, I think this is cast. what always happens to okay. me. I think this is the oaked one. That's right. All but right. I actually like the unoaked one better. Well, we're two for two on that. So yeah, I got it right. So we I, got it right. I'm. Well, so I, you, if you, if you like that one better, you take you, that. You take that, and I'll yeah. take this. So I'll, I'll take the one. I, you know, I, the way I looked at it was, we bought a pretty cheap sherry, and I thought the oak really transformed it. Now, you know, uh, allergies are getting in the way. A little bit. A yeah. little bit. But let's let's uh we should bottoms this up because we have a, one more taste to oh, do. We have another taste test? Well, I don't know if it's a test, but we have one oh, more tasting to okay. do. That's pretty good. That is pretty good. All right. So we're gonna open this so this is seven weeks into the whiskey. Um I think our producer Dasha will help us out and maybe now, how or, long are we planning? How, how long are you planning to age this overall? Or is this ready to go now, just, or what? Just a little bit. Well, I don't. So, if this was the first thing we put in there, seven weeks is probably about the right amount of time. Maybe eight. You have to do a weekly taste test. So it might be hard to see from there, but it start. It's not clear. Yep. It's, I can. I can see that it's definitely not clear anymore. There's a little bit of color starting to come, yes, but it's. You can see that on the But it's not. Camera. It's but it's not dark like like a bourbon or something that you buy at the house. Um, so the second time you use it, because some of that oak was already taken out and put into the sherry that we just tried a minute ago, it's going to take longer for this to take in the, uh, the oak characteristics into the whiskey. Now and we're going to get a little bit of that sherry flavor, like you said, out of it. Well, that's right? what, so what, what I promised to do is in a few weeks, whenever this is ready, we'll get that other set of my friend's whiskey that he did it straight without the sherry and see if we can tell the difference. That, that'll that really be the... So that'll be another blindfold taste test as exciting as that was this time around. So I'm going to give this a quick go. 
And this was made from <sighs> what? Moonshine? A, well, they call it moonshine, but it's not real moonshine. We've got got the bottle here. So this Am is I from supposed a supposed to taste this too. You're supposed to taste this is made from corn whiskey. So it's fifty it was fifty proof when it started. It's pretty strong. Um you know, it certainly has a little bit of sweetness to it that a straight moonshine wouldn't have, but uh, I don't think that we'll be uh, putting Jack Daniels out of business anytime in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's still pretty um, pretty sharp. But, you know, so it was interesting. Both of us could tell the difference. Yeah. You know, even though you like the other one better. I'll tell you what, though. I had a tough, tough time, even though it's really obvious to tell, and so I actually went to the doctor the other day to check on my nose because I, I can't smell. I, you know, I like to drink wine. I like to drink beer. I like to drink stuff. I try to exercise occasionally but so I can drink beer, so I can burn off all those calories. And um, I just have a tough time smelling. So I have uh, what they call a deviated septum, and they're going to – it sounds really bad, but they're basically going to straighten out the inside of my nose. So I'm not getting a nose job. So you're going to look the same. Well, I, I – I might see if they can make me look a little bit better. It'll be difficult for them to try because, you know, when you look like this, there's not much room for improvement. It's a real challenge. Right, right, it's a challenge. But um, but I tell you, so hopefully when I get that, I'll be able to smell these types of things much, much better. My my bigger fear is, though, because wh what do you guys always tell me? What? I don't I don't know. What do we... Are they... Well, what, I, what I'm really afraid of is that after the surgery, I'm not going to be able to take a dump anymore. Because it's just going to be so bad. Like, oh, they're pretty bad. Yeah. See, <laughs> see, that's what I'm saying. So I, I think it's not that bad, but it might just be because I can't smell at all. So maybe this nose surgery is going to be a uh, uh, a curse and not a blessing. Well, it might get you out of there faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might get. Yeah. That that's that's a fair point. So everybody's probably heard enough of that. We're gonna move this little barrel on, give it another couple of weeks to age, and we'll see it again hopefully soon. Sounds good. I, I can't wait to try it when it's uh, maybe even a little bit smoother than well, it is now. It, it's hard to imagine it getting any difficult, well, any more difficult to drink. So we've got uh, we've got one more segment today, Chris, um, right. and I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a choice. Been reading some news. There's a couple of interesting things. We got two choices to talk about. We got the story of got? Bell Knox. Bell Knox is a freshman at Duke University who also happens to be a porn star. That's how. She is uh, financing her way through that very expensive, but, you know, very prestigious institution. She has been outed recently, i.e. some people have said that she is the porn star and getting criticize, criticism on campus and from other porn stars. So that's one thing we can talk about. Okay. Or we can talk about that uh, college football players, at least at one university, have won the right from a, a court or from a ruling to unionize. Say, that in fact, they are employees and therefore can form a union and not, quote-unquote, student-athletes. What, what do you think we should delve into? Um, I could probably go both ways. Well, I'm pretty sure Bell Knox can go both ways, <laughs> but uh, what, what you, what you, which one are you feeling here? Uh, how about the, let's go with the college football players yeah. then? Yeah, you guys can look up Bell Knox on your own, check out the videos, see what you think. Well, you know, if you really want to hear it, email us and we'll, we'll jump into it. But let's talk but, about the, the... So you're saying they're unionizing. I mean, I thought... Employees unionize, workers unionize. Well, You're telling so, me college football play, I don't get it. So, so the students at Northwestern University, right? So it's a smart school. So you've got guys who maybe know a little bit. Um, you know, they filed a suit with the National Labor Relations Board, okay. in effect making the argument that you just said, which is we're not students, we're really employees. Our time is regulated, um, and we're not getting paid for all that thing for all, for all, for all that we do. Right. And they're making a lot of money off of it. So therefore, so they're we, saying they want to be paid. Well, I'm sure that's where it's going, but that's not what the suit said. The suit basically said that, look, we are actual employees. Our time is regulated. We have to go to practice. We have to go to film. We have to play games. That there's things being sold. Uh, we can't take certain classes. This is where a lot of the big stuff came in was we're not allowed to take classes at certain times because it conflicts with practice. So in effect, they're saying... Like night classes or things? Well, or classes that start at certain times. You can only take classes between certain times of the day. So in effect, we're being denied that full academic educational experience. And, and the other point is, well, you know, I can't really be an engineer because those classes are really hard and I need to study. And with all the time I'm taking for football, that's a full-time job and I can't really do it. In any case... 
But a lot okay. of them are playing or at that institution for a lot less than they would otherwise have to pay to be there, right? If they're if they're on a scholarship, then they're there for their athletic prowess and they're not paying anything for the education that they are getting. So how can they really complain? Well, let's before we jump into that topic, they won their suit. And the implications of that are private schools. So this only actually applies to private schools, this particular suit. Theoretically now, now it will go to appeal, but theoretically can form a union on the football team if they so desire, at which point they can make demands, be represented, et cetera. So that opens up the thing. Um, the important distinction is state schools now, because they are government institutions, are subject to the, in, the individual laws of each individual state. So let's just say, for example, that the University of Georgia filed a similar suit that would not mean that all state schools are eligible. It would mean all state schools in the University of Georgia are if they were to win such a suit. Okay. So it's interesting in a lot of ways in that um, you could have some schools who are unionized, the private schools, and then the whole bunch of schools who aren't. Okay. But so, so what does this mean in the long game? I mean, it, does this is this the path toward college football players being paid money to, to perform uh, these you know, athletic events? Well, you know, it, it could possibly be. It, I think and, a lot of and if, the, and if college football gets played, where does it end? Uh, college basketball players. What about college well, this baseball? Is, so this is the what about thing. Women's basketball. What about women's volleyball? Um, is that a good pattern to set? Well, you know, if you ask me, the reality is, you know, how many Jadavian Clowney number seven jerseys or Johnny Manziel number two jerseys got sold last year, and no money went to those two players. Now, granted, they're going to make a lot of money otherwise, but you talk about TV rights, video game rights, things like that. You know, basketball, football are the only two sports that are getting paid. The argument you just made was the argument that the NCAA has been making. But the reality is, is decisions like this are going to force the NCAA, I think, to make a good decision, which is to find a way to pay the players who are actually generating revenue. It's a business. It's really a business. Come on. Well, is but, okay, I went you know, to a university on a scholarship. I generated revenue for the university ultimately through, you know, reputation, through the, the name of the university. Does the university not benefit through academic people coming through that as well that then go come back and they fund the university and they, they give money back to it? Does the university not benefit from I, I everybody can, that ends up walking through there? I can guarantee you that we didn't generate as much as, you know, We didn't million, generate as much. I'm just saying, billion. where does it start? I mean, it's it, it feels like a slippery slope to me. And I'm, I'm a little bit playing devil's advocate here because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not so sure that players shouldn't get paid for well, I think, I think they the absolutely, monetary uh, I think they, abso they, I think they absolutely should. And when you think about it, it's, it's a minority of athletes who are going to go make millions of dollars in the pros. A lot of these guys are going to do it. They're maybe not going to get the education they really wanted because they're spending so much time playing sports. There's a high risk of injury concussions, things like that, that can have debilitating effects for the rest of their life. Um, it's not like they have a choice to go play pro because the way those rules are set up. And so it's not like they're really choosing to be in school. It's the only option they have. At the very least, pay them an, uh, uh, you know, a minimum wage per hour for all the hours they're in practice. So like you, know, you and I and a lot of students, we work on campus jobs and we get paid you know, seven bucks an hour to you know, work at the library or whatever thing like that. At the very least, pay these guys that. Well, aren't they like not allowed to have uh, campus jobs? Or well, something that's like the other that? thing. Most programs, they are not allowed to have other jobs or any jobs they have must be approved by the football program, which was actually one of the arguments that Northwestern players made was saying we can't get other jobs without approval from our coaches. So it's, um, it's, it's an interesting development. I think a lot of players think, yes, they should get paid something, but maybe a union's not the way to go. But I think you're going to run into a really interesting situation where if some universities are able to unionize and others aren't, does that create an advantage in recruiting? What really? It's, really, it's a really strange situation. Like I said, there's appeal processes to be had, but um, I think hopefully this will encourage and spur the NCAA to actually pay these guys at least something. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Well, yeah, it's definitely an interesting topic, and I'll be looking forward to seeing how it evolves here over the next year or two because it sounds like it's going to be a real hot-button issue. Absolutely. Well, I think we've covered enough ground today. We're going to go maybe drink some more of this sherry or whiskey. But we'll hope you join us next week. 
Check out our website. Get all the other stuff. You can always reach us with your thoughts, comments, criticisms, concerns, or questions at contact at fthebs.com. Our Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube handles are all FTBS TV. So check us out, and we look forward to seeing you again.